Welcome to another fabulous episode of My Orgasmic Life. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Gaia Morissette, and today we are going to talk about kink and trauma. And we're not sure where that's going to lead us, but that's part of the adventure. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> I do want to apologize for my dog who is, I don't know if you can hear the barking, but I'm sure the mail has come. And so he has to tell the neighborhood. So if that happens, I'm sorry. He's very it's, loud. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. So before we get into uh, our conversation and, and my fabulous co-host here, um, I want to do a couple of different housekeeping things. One, today's episode is brought to you by Tickle.life. Two, (laughs) remember ethical consumption, meaning support this creation by joining my Patreon. I show up for you guys, you show up for me. It's a win-win situation. All right, so Angel, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Angel. Uh, I am also professor sex. I do both things. I, um, I don't know. I'm a Sagittarius. I like plants. I eat hot tamales when I'm nervous. I don't know. What do you, um, <laughs> what kind of intro do you want? Do you want like the personal intro? Like what does my Tinder profile look like? Or do you want like the, pro- <laughs> no. like well, what do I that- send on my CV? Like, <laughs> Well, uh, give give us a sort of like, what do you kind of do in the world? Okay. What do I do in the world? So I, um, I do, I, I have, um, I do a lot of things because as you know, the only way to pay your bills during this work is to have many, many hats and yes. to juggle the plates are spinning and the hats are on your head and I love hats. So it's great, but I have a lot of them. And so I do generally speaking, I teach sex ed to adults and I've been doing that for a little over 10 years. And then we also recently launched a sex positive audio visual copywriting production company. And so, because we learned that it can be really hard to find people who want to work with you when they find out that the work you do is sex related. So those are, that's kind of the short, um, I, I went, so in terms of my educational background, um, people kind of get into sex ed either through like the public health sphere or through like the therapy sphere, or, um, you know, there's a number of ways, but the route that I kind of took was, um, research. And so my degree Um, I've done all the work and I've written everything and I'm defending my thesis in October, but my degree will be a master's in psychological science. And so that's kind of the short elevator pitch of who I am. Beautiful. All right. So, and your name, how about we, the whole name, give us your whole name. Oh, it's it's Angel Russell. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and the business is professor sex and you can find it at professorsex.com. Beautiful. And we'll have all of those details in the show notes. Okay. So let's talk about kink and trauma. That's a fun one, huh? Yeah. So I'll start with, there's different ways we can look at kink and trauma. There's the, the kink after trauma philosophy where, you know, you've experienced trauma in your life and you have, are wanting to explore kink and how do we navigate kink, the world of kink when we have a trauma base or trauma background. And then there's the, you know, you and I were talking recently and, and it was beautiful when you brought up, then there's the kink, the trauma that is created in kink when you haven't had the proper support that needs, whether it's education, some, you know, horrible experiences that the, that trauma that can be definitely created from some bad kink experiences. So which aspect do you want to, which, which one do you want to start with? Um, let's start with, I think, I think it can be good to start with the, like maybe separating what kink is from what trauma is. Like, mm-hmm. because I know for some folks, um, you can still hear me, right? Cause my, uh, yeah, your, your, your weird. thing, your thing got all weird. Your sound got weird for a second. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to fix it for a second. Give me a good quick two. Let me for a second. Okay. Uh-oh. And now we're, we're back. back. Okay. All right. We're back. Yeah. My cat bumped the cord and the microphone yes. unplugged. So that's what yes. happened. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I was just thinking if I, when I think of kink and trauma, yeah, I immediately think like, do those two roads, but I think the, like the place where those roads converge is 
having a little bit of a conversation about the difference because the nature of what kink can be is in itself behavior that in the wrong context or without consent could be very traumatizing. Yes. And so, um, that, so maybe just like, I'll, I just think, you know, I, I love the, it. So let's, the, let's, let's yeah. define that. So let's define what abusive behavior versus consensual kink behavior looks like. I like to tell people that like maybe the biggest thing is that mutual definition. Mm -hmm. So I am not going to come home and start knocking Steve around. And then he's like, what happened? And I'm like, I was BDSMing you. Like I, <laughs> he has to like agree that that is behavior he wants to engage in. And yes. we have both decided this is kinky and this is BDSM for us. And this is what that looks like. And I'm going to tell him ahead of time, like, uh, I, w I really want to knock you around a little bit. And he's going to be like, what's that look like? And I'm going to be like, well, it looks like maybe I'm going to grab a flogger or maybe I'm going to like give you a little like, right? Like whatever. And so we have a conversation and he's like, yeah, that sounds hot. Or no, I'd rather you use this instead. And I love that I'm talking, that's not the direction that our kink works in at all. It would be more like <laughs> Steve saying to me, Hey, like, <laughs> like, I love that I an example. That's not at all how we live our lives, which is why I couldn't carry it all the way through. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think, um, I, it, that's the big thing. Is it that mutual definite that like we have kind of, we have, it's a collaboration. Like we've collaborated on this experience and, um, we both know what's, we might not have like people go like, Oh, the surprise gets killed if it's too planned out. And I tell people, it's more like you're building a theme park together and mm -hmm. you guys are all going to decide what rides are in the theme park. And you're going to decide how tall you have to be to ride it. And is it a roller coaster? Is it a haunted mansion? Like whatever, you know, you're going to build your theme park. And then the dominant might decide which rides get ridden but you've built the theme park together. So nothing, and yeah. the dominant's not going to sneak in a water slide that you didn't know was there. Like, it. it's exactly. All, you, it's all above board. Yes, we've negotiated, we, we, yes. we've talked about it. You know, um, for me, when I'm talking to, you know, my peeps and my clients is that, you know, I'm, again, it's that whole having the conversation is key, right? And having a hard limits list conversation is key or you know other people yes. refer to it as a do don't list yes, um maybe. yes no maybe these these are the the different you know language around those lists and really going into those lists so everybody knows what the definition is that because the thing is is that i might say to you all right I hey really with this. i'd love to be spanked and you're like, I love spanking. And you're like, okay, well, we've had a great conversation about that. <laughs> but we have not. <laughs> but we have not had a great conversation about that. No, no, we have agreed to start a conversation. conversation. We've agreed <laughs> to start a conversation, but Angel isn't ready to spank me. And I no. am not ready to be spanked by Angel. No. Yet. No, then we have to talk, we have to talk about like, what does that mean? What implements are we okay to use? Do you like a sensation that's painful or do you like a sensation that's more like a butt massage? Do you like stingy? Do you like thuddy? Do you mind if you get bruises from this? Do you prefer to get bruises from this? Am I okay with bruising you? Like, <laughs> so. Exactly. All <laughs> those things need to be talked about just to talk about banking. Yes. That's fun activity. Yes. And so I if you're going to do anything else besides banking, yes. also like, is this something that's sexual for you? How do you feel about integrating things that are sexual? And what would that look like? Would that look like toys? Would that look like my hands? Would that look like our mouths? Would that look like, so like that becomes something else because maybe I'm thinking spanking time is sexy time. And guy is thinking, I don't want anything sexy to do with my spanking. That's not sexy time for me. That's therapy time. And I'm going to cry. And I'm like, if you cry, I'll die from that. Like, and so we have to, <laughs> exactly. we have to have the conversation and I use the lists I use when I, when I hand out and I'm happy to like share, you can, I can and send it to you, you can put it in the show notes. It's a, it's a yes, no, maybe list, but it's trauma informed. So one of the sections, the like prompts for how to have a conversation talks about things like if I'm working through trauma in this, or if there's trauma around this for me, or if this triggers me in a way I wasn't expecting, how do we want to deal with it? And have we had a conversation? Because to kind of get to the other part of the conversation, it might be the case that, you know, 
I'm spanking you and something hits you emotionally because it is emotional yeah. and you have a good cry. And maybe that was what you wanted. Maybe you wanted the spanking so you could have the good cry. And then I could really subtle afterwards. Right. And it's like beautiful. But if I like, didn't know that you were going to do that, that cry might really freak me out. And I might stop everything. And then you didn't get your release because I stopped it as soon as I saw you start to get emotional. And I, I shut it down thinking that, you know, we didn't talk about the emotion ahead of time. So I, that's something that I think people should be having conversations about too, is not just the physical safety, but our emotional, spiritual, mental safety. Like what happens if this is emotional for me, or if something does kind of come up for me mentally, am I okay with continuing to move through it? Yeah. Do you feel comfortable supporting me through that? Or does that mean we need to stop and like address that in a different space? Exactly. Exactly. Which is super, super important. So that the importance, see, as you can see, just in us trying to define <laughs> what is healthy kinkle, kink, kinkle, kink expression <laughs> versus dysfunctional and healthy expression. Um, is all of these conversations, consent yes. and conversations, consent conversations, yes. consent conversations. That's the most important piece, which then leads us into, I would say, what happens when we don't have those conversations and what ends up happening that on a physical, emotional, psychological place. I. And, and I'll say as good as people are at communicating and as long as you, like you could be doing this for 20 years and doing it with the same partner. And so you're, you just know each other so well, you just aren't going to see around every corner. You're not going to be able to think of every conversation you should have had. And sometimes we don't know we have a boundary or we don't know we have a trigger or we don't know we have a line until it's been crossed. Like it's just, yeah. and so it's not m malicious or bad planning. It's just part of the experience. Like one of the risks. So we talk about sexual risk. Health is a sexual risk, right? And we talk a lot yeah. about condoms and, and, and like testing and prep and all those things. But like the other sexual risk is that, and whether that's sex or kink or the integration of those things, is the fact that there are going to be things that come up that even with all your best intentions, nobody planned for. And yes. so then how do you do that? And how you handle that really can determine if that is traumatic or if that's safe and okay. And so another thing is like, okay, we talked ahead of time, but what's your plan for connecting afterwards? You know, do you have an aftercare plan? Um, if something does come up and you feel like, like, am I gonna be okay? If I, like, if I, if I do something and it registers as traumatic to you, even if my heart was not to be traumatizing and we did all our best work, if it registers as traumatic or if it triggers a trauma response or if it hits an, a button in you, am I gonna be okay hearing that? Mm -hmm. Am I gonna be able to hold space for you to talk through what happened and me not make it about me? Cause I know my instinct would be to go, let me tell you all the ways I'm sorry and how much I didn't mean it and mea culpa and please don't blame me for this. And I would make it, I mean, I hope I wouldn't, but I know my instinct would be, I need you to know I didn't mean to do that. Mm -hmm. And that would be maybe the, the not best approach. The best approach might be to just like, hold, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters that I didn't mean it. We don't want to think people hurt us on purpose, but like in the moment it matters that you're safe. And so am I ready to hold space for you? Well, and I think that that might be a great piece that you want to add to that pre-conversation, right? Yes. Is that okay? how do we handle emotions? And each one of us has a pretty good idea internally with themselves. Like, are they like, yeah, emotions are totally comfortable for me. Or like emotions are like, fuck that shit. <laughs> Abort vision, right? So understanding how you handle emotions, how yes. you handle expressing when you are emotional, how you deal with those things, coming into that conversation saying, okay, so here's what I know about me. Yes. What do you know about you? And how can we navigate in the event that something comes up and we have a hiccup? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that, I think that's such an important piece of going into it with success. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and it has to be, 
Um, I think, I think if people are not on the same page, like you can be on the same page about everything, but if you're not on the same page about how you're going to handle emotion or just handle a misstep, <clears throat> it also could be, maybe it's not emotion. Maybe it's, I hit you and I hit you in a spot that was not the spot I meant to hit you. And now you're a little bit injured and I need to address that. Or it's, you know, I said yes to something and then it turns out I was a no for it, you know, because sometimes that happens, it sounded like a good idea at the time and now I hate it. And yeah. so it's, it's, I now have to have conversations that feel a little bit like rejection and criticism. It feels like one of us is wrong. Um, and maybe that's not really true, but it feels like that in the moment, right? None of us, it, it's definitely not a sexy feeling to think that I physically or emotionally or mentally hurt my partner, mm -hmm. right? Um, in a way they didn't want to be hurt. <laughs> and so if I, if I am not, if my partner, if their preference is, Hey, if that happens, I need some space to work through it before we talk about it. Yeah. But my preference is I need to talk about it immediately. I kind of want to know that before it comes up, because I definitely would be inclined to make it worse. Cause I am like, I like, please, can we talk through this? And, and I'm the opposite. I'm the opposite. I'm like, all right, I have to sort out what the fuck just happened. I got to go sort out what I need then I can come back to the table and then we can have a conversation about all the things, but I don't know what those things are. And I need my own personal space to go figure out what those things are. And if I know that ahead of time, then I'm not going to take it personally or push you. But what I might ask you for is, can you give me something that looks like a time limit? Can we agree yeah. to come back in a few hours or do you need an, do you need to sleep on it? You know, so that, cause like there's the, I need some space is a very scary thing to hear from someone you care about. Even if I care about you enough to just play for a scene. If I think I've harmed you and your response is I need some space, that's a super healthy boundary to set. But if it's limitless, that can be terrifying. And then the other person will want to push, but I can say, oh, if, if I know you're going to touch base with me, you're going to sleep on it touch base with me in the morning then I can deal with my own emotional labor and do my own thing in the meantime. And then when we touch base, I'm like ready for that. And I won't feel like I need to check in before you're ready yeah. where, you know, and, and, and so that's a, a great way to negotiate around that. If one of you, cause I process by talking. So my mm -hmm. preference would be, even if I don't know exactly what I want to say, just having the ability to do that. So I would need to, I would need to know ahead of time, like, okay, yeah. you're a space person, which is a great, which is great. To have the, to know that once you know those things and you tell each other those things, you can come up with strategies on how exactly. do we navigate that. So let's get into yeah. um, the piece that I often see in the community that is not happening, which is when you're playing with somebody, we don't talk nearly enough or at all about any trauma background. Ah, right. So, so you're like, so you're going to play with a, you're at, at a play party and you're going to play with a new partner ah. and, and you say, okay, so what should I know? Do you have any physical things? Are you on any medication? Like you go through this whole checklist of things, but no one asked you. So do you have any trauma that I need to be aware of that might come up during this activity? Cause that's not sexy. It's not sexy to talk about my trauma. Like, oh my goodness, right? Like, that's why we don't do it. It's so much work to just talk about STIs because those aren't sexy either. It is yeah. so much work to just be honest about like your health status. Yeah. So by the time I have done that labor and I have like, I, okay, I've identified a play partner. There's labor because there's yeah. rejection possibly in that. So, okay, I've gotten over that hump. And now we have to talk about our health status. And like, I'm going to reveal that I had a spinal surgery. So my back, you know, has some limitations. And so I've gone through all those things, which has the potential to be a little vulnerable vulnerable and maybe embarrassing. Right. And so then now like talk about my trauma, like Gaia, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what? I know, but you know what happens You're right. when you don't, you, you get traumatized, but yeah, it's horrible. It's such a bad experience. Right. I well, it's like trauma roulette. Like what's happening is you're, if you are not talking about your trauma with your play partners and you have trauma to unpack, cause not everybody has it, which is beautiful experience. Yeah. And so if you don't, and, and that's the thing is if you don't have trauma to unpack, then it maybe isn't, it hasn't occurred to you that your play partners might. Yeah. And if you do have trauma to unpack, it can be scary to be like, do I want to dump this on a, how do I dump this on a brand new person, but still keep myself and them safe. And so it is like Russian roulette where every time I'm going to spin the wheel and yep. maybe this will be fine. 
And then it's like, okay, I didn't need to talk about it until it isn't. Yes. And when it isn't, mm-hmm. it goes sideways real quick, so real bad. bad. And then so coming, bad. and you think having the conversation ahead of time is bad. Recovering from that, that can be, I mean, talk, re-traumatizing yourself can really impact everything. Like, and it's yeah. not to victim blame. It's not like, oh, you did this yourself. It's more like this experience, it's really worth it to do the labor, to have the conversation ahead of time, even if it's just a check-in, like, listen. And I I think, yeah. And I think that, you know, maybe we can talk about, uh, give some examples of different ways in which we can bring up our trauma, that it doesn't have to be like a therapy session. It does does not have to be go through all of the horror show that uh, you've been through right? But the key important ingredients that the person that you're playing with needs to know, right? And I would start with, first of all, just acknowledging, you can say, I have trauma in my background. Just, yep, just that language right there. That Right there. Uh, Two, this is what it looks like when I'm triggered. So knowing what your physical responses, your emotional responses, your things that are happening internally with you, emotionally with you, what does it, how does a trigger present for you so that your play partner can be Is knowing aware. what to look for. Yeah. Know because you for. might, if you get triggered, your safe word is useless. Like exactly. exactly. And that's the thing is I... Safe words are such a great 101 level tool in terms of getting people to remember they need to check in with each other. But honestly, like if real trauma comes up or real injury comes up, like something that's an, that's urgent and needs to be addressed, your safe word's not going to do it for you. You guys need to be paying attention to each other and really checking in with each other. And if I know ahead of time, so some people subspace looks like I'm dissociating. Right. Exactly. And, and it's beautiful and floaty. And I want to be in that space and, and don't interrupt me unless you're going to change the sensation in a way that will jar me. Right. Like, and let me be in my subspace. Cause that's what I wanted. But for some people that dissociation is a, tra- is a sign that trauma has been triggered. And so again, if I don't know that, and I think my partner's in subspace and I just keep going and they're like moving deeper and deeper through a trauma response. And I'm like, they must love this, but I haven't checked in with them or like, Hey, are you okay? Or Hey, like tap your foot if you need water or whatever. Like I haven't done anything to check in. So it's on both of us, right? It's on me to say, Hey, there's trauma in my background, but then it's also on my play partner to like, just be paying attention. And if my, if my awareness shifts, if my communication shifts, if my, if something starts happening that we hadn't talked about, like then my, then just check in. It doesn't kill the moment to be like, how you doing, baby? Like, you know, just check in. And, and if you get a response that doesn't feel lucid, if you get a response that doesn't feel aware, if you get a response that like, if you're red flags, something will go off, trust your gut. Right. Like, and, and so, yeah, I think that's like a good starting point is like, one, are we checking in? But yeah, two. So some examples. Yeah. I love it. I have trauma in my background and maybe even being specific. I have trauma in my background or I have sexual trauma in my background, or I have some trauma around physical violence. So, you know, there's a couple of things that might not be great for me, or maybe I want to do this, but it's possible that it might, whatever, you know? And so being like, you don't have to, let me tell you all about this thing that happens. Like, you don't have to do that. You don't, oh, you, people aren't owed that side of you. No, you but, don't need to share that. You don't need to go into that much detail, but knowing what your trigger response, what that looks like, what potential spots that might be time, you know, yeah. might be sensitive, that area, this is why yeah. we should pay attention. Yeah. And also how do you like to be treated if you do get triggered? Right. Yes. So that's the other thing too. Yeah. What, what helps you move through that trigger? Yeah. And that's the thing too, being willing, and this is maybe just a discussion about trauma in general. Uh, we get, um, I think it's tempting to avoid triggers and, um, and then when they come up, when they surprise, cause sometimes we know, sometimes we know that something's likely to be triggering for us. And so we just sort of are like, I'm not there for that today. And that's okay. Like you don't just show up for every time something's gonna be triggering for you, but also triggers sometimes surprise us and yes. catch us off guard. And so, um, if our, if we always are practicing avoiding our triggers, then it can be really, um, jarring and really 
uh, scary and disempowering when a trigger comes up and we're not in control. Like, so if I'm the submissive and I'm not really quote unquote in control of the scene and something comes up that feels triggering and I'm used to my response to a trigger being to like run and I don't have any practice moving through a trigger and I don't have any practice like feeling my feelings in a way that's safe, then that may create a situation where like that playtime doesn't go in a healthy way for me. And so if you do have trauma, if you haven't taken the time to practice moving through your triggers and you haven't taken the time to know what it's like to feel your feelings and you can't say to somebody, this is what it looks like when I'm triggered and this is how I need to be treated when I'm triggered and this is an experience that would be healthy for me if I was triggered, that that's where you do that work on your own with a therapist first yeah. so that you have those tools. And, and it's just like saying, I, if it's just like, if you showed up and you said, I actually have no idea if I have any STIs because I've never been to a doctor and I've never been tested and my condom use is intermittent. And so I actually have no idea what my health status is like that somebody would say to you, Hey, like, okay, let's go get tested. Right. Like, yeah. and let's go, you know, maybe get some treatment or whatever. And so yeah. it's the same thing. It's not, there's no shame, but no. you want to get those tools. Yeah. You need to have those tools and it's not your play partner's responsibility to be your therapist. And this is a really important piece that, um, can prevent some problems that can happen in your relationship really quickly. Um, which is, if you have trauma and you haven't gotten the tools and the support tools that you need to have outside of your relationship and you start to have your partner start taking care of you and rescuing you, this creates a really un unhealthy and really devastating relationship dynamic that happens. Yes. So it is not your partner's responsibility to take care of you. It's your responsibility to have those tools, share those tools with your partner so yes. your partner can choose to use those tools. Or not. <laughs> or yeah. choose not to use we those want, tools. Yeah, that's consent, right? Like we want to be able to exactly. give our, be able to opt out. Like maybe your partner's also moving through trauma yeah. and maybe they just don't have, maybe they, they want, so, I mean, we are responsible to take care of each other in the bounds of the scene. Yes. What we're not responsible for is each other's emotional labor or mm -hmm. each other's like, uh, the learning we do outside that space to be ready to be in that space. And so it, it might be like, I really want to be like a loving, caring, supportive partner, but I, um, know that I have some trauma around this stuff. And so I would want to make sure that a partner I was with knew about that because as much as I, I would want to be able to be helpful and supportive. I would need to know ahead of time what that might look like because I also want to like enjoy the scene and I don't want to be there and be working and be like, go into therapy mode and go, because it, if I am also, if I also end up in an emotional space, I can support them, but maybe not that way. And so we would need to have a conversation about what that might look like. And do we both have the skills to communicate? And do we both have enough awareness to support each other? And does aftercare look the same to both of us like that? I just, I would be very incompatible with somebody who um, could not like co-facilitate that experience with me, could not collaborate on that experience with me. It would not be good for either one of us. Mm -hmm. And I think, so the, the key in that is that please go reach out uh, to me or Angel for some professional support on learning how to have those tools. <laughs> yes, yes. And I'll tell you, I am, I, yeah, yeah, please reach out. Please, yeah. please, like, I am, uh, part of my background is I'm a certified sexual assault victims advocate. And so I'm not a therapist, but I am, uh, between that and the other work that I do, I have an extremely robust library of resources for helping people have these conversations and helping people work through this stuff. And so my role as an educator does have a lot of very specific intersect. And I know yours does too, yes. in what this looks like. And so um, we might include introducing you to a therapist as part of how we relate with you, um, because that's not what we do, but we're definitely going to be able to be helpful to you and be supportive of you because it's not, let us do that. So your play partner can just play with you. Exactly. <laughs> they just have fun. Let that, be fun. Fun. Let that yeah. be fun. Yes. Let us help you be. navigate the other stuff. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, you want to share, let's talk a little bit Let's go into our own stuff yeah. a little bit because okay. you know yeah. we've been we've been we've been talking and teaching and stuff so let's let's go into our own stuff yeah so heads up for folks this might get like messy and 
maybe that's fun or maybe that's not like <laughs> but, <laughs> well, for folks watching <laughs> yes they're listening who knows where that's gonna go and what's gonna end yes. up coming up content yes. warning <laughs> yes exactly we are gonna talk about trauma so. we're gonna talk about trauma <laughs> Um, do you want to go first? You want me to go first? What, um, where do no, you I can need? go, I can, I can go. Um, yeah, I, huh, I, when you said kink and trauma, I can't hear that phrase together without thinking about my own. Um, I, I was in a situation where I was very much, um, I don't, I don't know if I like the word victim or survivor or just, I experienced this. I don't know how to like relate to, but experienced some very traumatic, uh, somebody, somebody who used kink as an outlet to be horrible. And so, um, I was in a situation where, um, you know, I have been, I've been in the kink community for a long time in and out. I've, uh, kink has been a part of my sexuality and a part of how I relate to my sexual partners for, uh, like 20 years. And so most of my adult life, um, even before I had the language to call it kink, I can look back and go, Oh, that's what that was. And, um, and it's been a really, a real joy for me. It's been really important to me. It's made or it's been like a make or break in a lot of relationships, because again, like if it is a really important part of your sexuality and you're with a partner that's totally freaked out by it, there's going to be like a point where you don't have anything to say to each other anymore. Like, you know, I'm not going to ask a partner who's uncomfortable with choking me to choke me. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it's so consent, but anyway, so, um, we had gone, uh, so Steve, uh, my husband and I had gone to a conference, um, and it was a kink specific conference and I was there doing some research. Um, but, uh, uh I also wanted to play while I was there. And so I have these really specific, we talk about consent, we talk about power dynamics. I'm very um, intentional. I don't play a lot in our community here because I teach so much in our local community yeah. and the power dynamics between like educator and student, um, it can get messy. And so yeah. I just, I get a little bit, um, I maybe hyper alert around that stuff. And so, oh, sorry, my cat just attacked me, scared the crap out of me. Um, <laughs> and so, um, which I totally understand. I also don't play in the community because I teach yes. and all the, the kind of stuff. Yes. And so I was excited because we were traveling. And so even though I was going to be there and doing some teaching while I was there, I was like, well, there'll be so many other people also educating there that there might be a, and they don't live with me. So there might be a pool of folks where I get a little playtime in, or at least Steve and I can play adjacent. Right. So yes. I get that you still, cause dungeon spaces are fun and you get that community sense. And, um, I don't even like to play in our dungeon here because I teach in it all the time. And so I just don't do. And so I was like really excited. And so we got through the whole weekend and we had made friends with this couple and they were um, not teaching at that time at that event, but they had been teaching at that event for like eight years prior to that one time. And so I identified like they seemed safe and I had vetted and I did all my work. And it turned out that they were very predatory. And when we got into playtime together, um, they were very abusive and they very, um, they just disregarded consent in some really big ways and took it. There's also a real heavy drinking culture at this conference. Mm. And, um, I didn't, ex I, I'm not a fan of drinking and playtime mixing. And so I actually didn't expect we had been drinking a lot. I didn't expect any BDSM to occur. Mm -hmm. And so I was like super drunk. And then all of a sudden I'm getting BDSM. And it was like that example of like, what I'm BDSMing you. Well, we didn't talk about that. So no, you're not, that's not what this is. And, um, but in a much less fun and much more harmful way. And so, uh, it ended up being like several hours of this experience. And when we left, I just was like, it like rocked me and it's, I'm still kind of working through like, what does that look like when you're in a space where you've done everything you think you can do to take care of yourself? Mm -hmm. and, and then still something happens like now what? Right. And I went through this time frame of, um, I, I haven't really talked openly much about it. I tried to reach out to the organization to let them know what happened. Cause there were like weapons involved. Like it was a really unsafe experience. And the organization was very like, not our problem. Like they wanted to kind of distance themselves. And, and, um, so I didn't really pursue that. And, um, I, it just impacted my relationship to kink. I was gaslighting myself. Like I'm supposed to be this educator who knows all this stuff. And I, how could I get myself into this situation? And how did I let this happen? You know, and all of that. And, and I, and something that had been this huge joy that had been this huge, beautiful part of me was now like, all I could think about was this one thing and all of the ways I had to move through it. And, um, 
and I, I'll say my relationship with my therapist has been like a really beautiful, like she's extremely kink positive and, um, you know, she's been really good at like helping me identify what working through that looks like and helping me identify like how to have these conversations. And, um, and it's been a really long road, but I, um, yeah, like that stuff happens and it, it happens and it, I won't say it happens all the time. There are totally ways to be safe, but I will say one lesson I learned and I not to, I'm not, I don't feel like victim blaming myself, but I did learn, like, I don't like the idea of drinking in these situations. Like mm -hmm. if I am not, I know that if I had not been as drunk as I, if I hadn't been drunk, like the way that I was like a couple of drinks is one thing. This was not that this was like, we'd been partying all night. And, um, I was like, no kids. woo! <laughs> so I'd been partying all night. And, and I know that I would have, um, probably handled some things differently and maybe ended up and maybe not, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't have like this person was pretty hell bent on being terrible. And that's not on me. That's on them. Mm -hmm. And that part of my work is knowing that. And part of my work is like, so now I have to build trust back and I have to build trust back with partners, mm -hmm. but with me, like a lot of it is, it's really been about trusting myself and saying like, it's okay. It doesn't say anything about my trustworthiness to myself or my value that someone was able to be predatory towards me. Like, mm -hmm. do you know, you know what I mean? Like yeah. people, some people are just monsters Yes, and that's not on me. And that, yeah. I think that's been the hardest thing. And I, I don't, I don't know if it, that, that like feels like familiar to anybody who's listening, but it's, I think that for me was the hardest thing to work through was how did I let, I, I should know better. Right. Cause we do all this education. And so if you've done, if you do all the education and you've got, it turns into like a little mental checklist, like, especially these lists, these yes, literal checklists we give people yes, yes no, maybe yes. list and you do yeah. all the negotiation and then something bad still happens and it can be, um, I think you have to give yourself permission to be upset. Yes. You have to sex positive doesn't mean down for anything. So like, it's okay if you have trauma and then you have to take a break from things to heal. Yeah. Like that's okay. And that's totally okay. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing too, is I was like, what does it say about me if I'm not interested in kink for a while? Yeah. Like, and I wasn't, I was fine to teach it to other people. I was fine to stay in, but just for myself, I was like, I'm not relating to it the same way. And that, that was a long healing process there. And, and what my, what my kink looks like now is very different than what it looked like before. I was definitely a lot more into some sensation and pain play that now I am really interested in a lot of the nurturing side of kink and a lot of the side of kink that is more, um, the, the, the power exchange where there is like a more nurturing dynamic and there's a more, um, a softer dynamic. And, and that's been fun to learn about myself and to learn about what my partners are capable of and that that's still BDSM and kink. And that's still mm -hmm. like a really valid part of the kink experience. And so it's actually become a really beautiful journey of like giving myself permission to relate to myself and my partners and my sexuality and kink in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that it wasn't like a, a failing on my part that I couldn't just jump right back into kink. Like I had to take a break and like, and learn what are my triggers and learn like, what do I need and learn like what's okay with me and what's not. And so, yeah, I had to do all that work that we're telling people to do. Like I had to go do it. And it's been, I think this is, I think actually, uh, this coming weekend will be the fourth anniversary of that event. Mm. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's not, it wasn't like overnight, you know, it's been like, and I would say I'm still working through it, but yeah. Well, I want to say, first of all, thank you for being honest and sharing. And I know that that can be really hard, especially coming from that place of the educator and that the place of the expert and all those places. So thank you for risking and sharing because I love that piece around not blaming yourself. And, you know, when we comes to any kind of trauma, that's kind of the thing that ends up happening, right? Is that, you know, we believe that it was our fault in some capacity and yeah. coming out of that place to, to, to acknowledge that it is not your fault and to own that to the world was, is beautiful. So thank you for sharing with us. Yeah. You get, I don't know. Um, I don't know if you can relate to this, but there's a little bit of like imposter syndrome around mm -hmm. being a sex educator and being a kink educator and being a trauma, uh, educator and 
having to work through things around those, you know, not having like this. I think people think that we have like perfect sex lives that are always, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think people think we're just having like tons of perfect, amazing sex and that it just looks like a porn set all the time. And that everything always goes exactly as planned and the lighting's always great. And like, yeah, no. And, we're always up for it. And that we always have a plethora of partners who are up for it. I think people have this image and like my, my, my sex life is messy and my sex life is complicated. And my sex life, like I'm your, my path as an educator has been my path as a student. Like yes. I have been learning and growing. And so, yeah, I had a lot of imposter syndrome and I still do from time to time. Like, Oh, is it, how can I get up in front of folks and talk about X, Y, Z knowing that in my own life, it maybe doesn't look like that. Like, mm -hmm. and so that's been fun too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's like another conversation. That's yes. a whole other show yes. that we could have right. about that. Um, so what about you? Tell okay, me your story. So I would say for me, trauma and kink have had a very beautiful and messy and ugly relationship and fucking hot. Like, so it's been like all things, <laughs> it's like all things. So um, I guess the best way I wanna start for me is that I have a background of satanic sexual abuse and ritual abuse, as well as shit ton of childhood sexual abuse. And so my background is riddled with trauma and violence and horror show. So needless to say, that's going to develop, be part of who I am as a sexual being, and it's going to play itself out throughout my sexuality. And I remember when I first started to explore kink as a submissive side of things, because I'm a switch. So I play on many different many different ways. And on the submissive side, um, I remember kink being this profound healing, reclaiming my trauma. So in particular, breath play is and being choked is, a, is an example I want to share. So as a child, raped, gang raped, choked, not a nice time. So I couldn't have anybody touch my throat anywhere, anytime. So I decide after I've been exploring, you know, spanking and being domed and all this stuff that I'm like, all right, I'm going to reclaim choking. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm like, I'm going to reclaim this. Scary. So it was terrifying. So I, I say to my partner at the time, I'm like, okay, I want to reclaim this. Let's see how this goes. So I very much went into it in a very conscious way. And I also really important to understand that I had all sorts of trauma background around yeah. how to deal with this as shit comes up because shit's going to come up. You didn't just dive in blind. <laughs> no, I didn't. I don't know. I just, you know, don't try this at home without the tools that you need. Okay. Yes, have your tools. All right. So. I remember the first time having, taking his hand and putting it on my throat and panicking, <laughs> full mm. on trigger, panic, all the things. Then, then the next time him having his hand on his, my throat and him having me open my eyes and us breathing together and he's like, you're safe. I'm like, I'm safe. And so we like breathing through it. And so, you know, I'm like, okay. Love that. Sorry, I'm not crying. <laughs> <laughs> That's just really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so, uh, that, got, uh, that hit me. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. So yeah. I'm like, okay. Then the next time I'm like, hey, let's do it a little bit longer. So we got so that we got so that we could do it longer. Yeah. But then what really fascinating happened was that I started to have arousal response. So now. Yeah. <laughs> My vagina showing up to the party. <laughs> You're like, we didn't discuss this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, all right, let's let's see where this goes. And then I started to actually crave his hand on my throat as part of 
feeling safe yeah. and feeling connected and feeling uh, lustful and desire. And so there was this beautiful transformation that happened. Now, through that, there was a lots yes. of triggers, lots of crying, yes. lots of freaking out, lots of me working really hard to not uh, make him into the predator and making sure that he wasn't my actual perpetrator. And there was a lot of work grounding and, and grounding yeah. and being solid and being present and setting boundaries yes. and communicating so much work. It was so much work and it was not <laughs> sexy a lot of the way. It was not sexy through that process. Until it was. Until it, now. <laughs> Let's fast forward. Anybody comes anywhere near my throat, I come. Yeah, I bet. That's right? I mean, I'm a little hot thinking about it. So I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like, woo. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So that process was an eye opener of like, I can actually utilize kink and BDSM yeah. to take back my power from yes. my trauma. Bingo. Absolutely. Yes. With all of the tools. I just need to remind yeah. everybody again with all yes. the work and all of the tools that went along with that process. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I, it, it, it was very touching and wonderful and beautiful. And I feel so honored to share that space with you. That was really a great story. Um, and Thank such a beautiful you. example of that other piece we talked about, right? Like how people can work through, use kink to work through trauma. And um, I think like the first thing you said when you talked about like your first experience was you taking his hand and putting it on your throat. And so you were really in control of that whole situation. And so even though yep. it resulted in a panic attack, you were safe and yes. you, and so like, and I think that's the thing is we're very used to, as we're learning, as we're learning about our trauma, we're used to associating our panic responses with unsafe situations. Yeah, And so part of that is I've created a safe situation. I've created a situation that I am in control of that I know is safe so that when I have the panic response, I can remind myself that I'm safe. And it may not mean that I won't have the panic. I might still have the panic and the freak out and the trigger, but I'm able to, I have the knowledge and information that I'm safe and that, and that's a different relation. And, and you have, so it's not, at that point, I don't even think it was a different relationship to the choking. I think it was a different relationship to the panic. And that's kind of what starts, you know, and the, then that, that, that's the, the, the piece around reclaiming your yeah, power it, period, like from trauma. Yes. Is, it doesn't matter what the context, the context is. is. Yes. Is that piece about, as we were talking earlier about trauma avoidance versus trauma avoidance, where tra where the trigger is constantly controlling every aspect of your life and because yes. you're trying to avoid it and you're terrified of having it yes. it controls everything yes and so you are still in the victim powerless stage yes. of your existence because you don't know that you can handle it you don't know that you can move through it you don't know that you won't die and yes. that you can handle whatever is going to happen on yes. the other side of that. That is that shifting of learning that no matter what the trigger is, no matter what the situation, not I'm not going to die yes. and I'll be able to handle it. It may not be comfortable and it certainly no. isn't sexy. No, because but your brain is relating to it the way it related to it when your life was at stake. Like that's exactly. the thing is like, you've got to cut ourselves some, some slack, right? Like that's why we avoid it is because our brain did what it needed to do to help us survive. And it worked. Exactly. We survived. Look, we're here. Right. Yeah. And so of course we are now it's, it's now encoded that when that response comes up, we retreat because, or we have whatever our trauma response was, fight, us. flight, freeze, appease, yeah. right? Like we go into that trauma space and we respond to the trauma, even yeah. if the trauma is not happening right now, our body's telling us it is. Yeah. And so part of the work that a lot of folks have to do around trauma is learning that, learning that like your brain was helping. Yep. Brain. And now we're going to teach it a new way of yes. 
and you have to teach it. And the to. only way to teach it is to, you, you are going to have to feel your feelings and you're going to have to feel yep. them in spaces that are safe and you have to create safe situations. And kink does give people a lot of really beautiful space to do it. But I'd say the other component, like we talked about is like, what is the field? Like you don't want to, what we don't want to do is like swoop into a dungeon and start working through our trauma on unsuspecting like play partners. No. Right. Like, no. We want to go through, we want to have a plan and we want to go through this with somebody who has signed up to go through this process with us. And maybe, um, that person, maybe, maybe we've got a therapist or a coach or somebody who's got some expertise in what trauma looks like in our brains and what healthy kink looks like and what the marriage of those two things are that can help guide us and help coach us through conversations, through these feelings. Right. And those people exist. Yeah. us. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it. like, <laughs> small, slightly inappropriate plug, but like, uh, it's, it's, it really is. I mean, that's for me, like I've been, um, I, I, a lot of my healing has been that, that same thing was, I remember at one point my therapist got in my face a little, I love her cause she does that. And she was like, you're really good at talking about your feelings, but do you ever just feel them? And I was like, I didn't even know what she was meant. I was like, how, of course I'm feeling them. How else would I be talking about them? She goes, no. And then she said something. And I don't know if she just had it in her pocket for a while, but she said something and I instantly just like, like lost it. And she wouldn't give me tissues. And she like, and I was like snotty and messy. And I'm like <laughs> in her office, like a baby, just like losing it. And she like took the tissues away from me. And she was like, just feel it. Yeah, and yeah. it was, and she was able to say like, you are safe. So yeah. Just feel it. And like learning that, and that like learning that I could learning yeah. that I could have the feeling learning that this thing could occur, this trigger could happen and that I would be safe. And I had signed up for the process. So it was not like she snuck it in on me. Like yeah. I, knew what I was there for like, so I wasn't like shocked, but it was so good. And so I'm able to take that to have those conversations now with my partners. And also if stuff comes up and my partners are like, we don't know what to do with this. I have a resource to go back and say, you know, cause I don't have to, that was the other thing. It's okay that I can share my expertise with other people and also need that support for myself. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. I have, and I think that's a really, I love that piece because I have a team around me yes. that I call when I'm a fucking mess. <laughs> you have to, you have, I to. have to. And, and, and and sometimes they just mirror back to me the information. Yep. Sometimes it's just to let me have my feelings and just space, to have some a safe space, space, a safe space to fall apart and just do the things that I need to do. But we all need that. And that is not a sign of weakness. That is nope. a sign of strength. strength, of being able to really be real and vulnerable and who we are. And when we are real and vulnerable in who we are, that's when we know how to share who we are with others. Yeah. It's hard to share who we are when we don't know who don't we know. are. Don't know. Yeah. You can't, you have to learn that. And it's okay that that takes a minute, right? Like it's okay that. <laughs> it takes a lifetime. Takes, like, yeah. Yeah. It's okay that that's not, you're not, you don't have to be an expert in you all the time, but you definitely no. can't expect other people to be either. No. Um, another okay, so, thing. Yeah. Okay. No, go. Because you and I could talk for a really, really long time. Yeah. So let's, t let's tie up this show and then we'll, we'll have you back and we can have another conversation yes. deeper about uh, whatever comes up next. But it. what's the one thing that you really want the audience to take away from our conversation that we had today? I would say give yourself permission to be messy to not know everything, to ask questions, to be curious, you know, like just give yourself permission to not, um, have it all together, to not be okay. Like, I think that's, that's what was the most helpful thing for me. And that's with my trauma survivors, like just give yourself permission to, and to redefine what a healthy experience is for you. If you're working through trauma or you've experienced trauma, giving yourself permission to, that, that, that there's not this idea of like, I have to go back to normal. Like that doesn't exist. Mm -mm. You're going to, everything will be different. Things will feel different. They will be amazing. They will be wonderful. Your life can be beautiful and full of color and maybe even better experiences than you had before, but it will not be the same as it was. It won't, you can't get in a DeLorean and undo that. 
Mm-hmm. And so getting rid of that idea of like this idea of back to normal, like doesn't exist. And so giving yourself permission for that too. I love it. Those are beautiful. What I would like the audience to take away is that you're not alone. You don't have to do it alone. Please get the tools that you need. So while you're being messy, you're not being abusive to others around you. Um, It's important that we are okay with being messy, but that messy doesn't, isn't about oozing our mess on everybody else (laughs) and expecting everybody else to fix it. Yep. So please make sure (laughs) that you reach out to some, get a a team of people around you that Mm -hmm. can support you through that process so that you don't harm your relationships with others while you're being, while you're working through your mess. And you deserve that support anyway. Yes. Yes. You deserve it for your own health. Yes. So, all right. So how can people spend more time with you, Angel? Okay. So I'm in like a billion places on social media and the internet and whatever. So if you just go to professorsex.com, there's like all the little social media links on top. There's a search bar where you can put in terms and so I'll pop up there. So that's probably the best place to go is just professorsex.com. And that's got everything is lives there. Beautiful. You want to spend more time with me, you can visit me at the hub that allows you to enter the empire that is my life. I right? love it. It's a beautiful space. <laughs> um, go to GaiaMorissette.com and that will take you to all the other places and all the different hats and all the worlds that I play in in whatever capacity you need to spend time with me. Don't forget to support Um Angel, do you have any, you have a Patreon, don't you? I do. I do have a Patreon. Let's talk talk about that for a second. Okay. So yeah, I do have a Patreon. Right now, um, my patrons and I are doing um, like coffee dates together. And actually, this is the first time I'm announcing it, but I'm just getting ready to launch a um, working through sexuality after sexual trauma series. But you will have to be a patron to move through the series at any level. So patrons at any level will be able to do it. And so that is going to launch in June and um, hopefully. (laughs) And uh, so yeah, um, and that that will be fun. But yeah, it's it's, if you go to patreon.com slash professor sex. So because of what we do, you can't just search professor sex. It won't come up. You have to type it in, um, or just click the Patreon link on my website, but yeah, I'm there. Beautiful. So also come support my Patreon. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways in which you can play and interact with me, um, in that way. And don't forget to listen to My Orgasmic Life as the podcast version of it on your favorite podcasting platform. And I also host Tickle.Life's podcast. So go check out Tickle.Life. And we're always looking for new guests who want to share about their first experience of things on Tickle.Life's podcast. So all the links will be in the show notes. Have a juicy day. May it be filled with exploration, curiosity, and conversation. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye.